So, thank you very much for having me here. And I will talk a little bit about our experience towards this microservice event Exxon thing and how it worked out for, for us. So, I will tell you about myself, a little bit about the company, about Ferratum, and then what we have been doing for pretty much the last year and plus a couple of months prep before the last year, and what have we learned along the way. My name is David Kalashi. I'm Chief Architect at Ferratum since somewhere end of 2016. And amongst other, I'm holding the ownership of something which is called the Smart IT Program, which is one of the development programs we launched within our company. I have roughly 17 years experience in the industry, mostly financials, some slight telco. I'm a tech geek by any means, because I truly believe that technology is moving this world forward. And as I found out, I'm a culinary expert, because spot the error. <laughs> Here. <laughs> so whoever did print these cards, thank you. Okay, Ferratum. So we are a Finnish-based company. We are 13 years on the market, founded in Helsinki. We hold an EU banking license, and we are quoted uh, on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. One very impressive figure about the company is that within its 13 years of existence, within every year we have produced a profit. So we were constantly a profit-making organization, not burning investors' money. We have a subsidiary, which is now called Global IT Services, where I work, and this is our company IT hub located in Bratislava. We have 133 employees as of now. If you would like to check it out, we have a nice website where you can read more about what we are doing. So back to this smart IT thing. What the hell is it? It's a company-wide development program we launched in 2017 with the goal of sort of refurbishing and building our next generation IT backbone that will sort of serve us for the upcoming future and that we can get rid of what brought us to this point. And why? And I have it wrong according to Alar because I have, should have uh, used a different graphic with this nice bug. But in this case we had bought a monolith and it was both full of crap so it's kind of like a fair deal. And <laughs> At a certain point, we kind of made a decision that, okay, we need to start over because we just carried over way too much legacy and debt and past mistakes. So we launched this program and we set a couple of goals. One of them was to be modular and to somehow embrace reusability. It's, we are operating currently in 25 markets, 25 countries. And in this context, it's extremely extremely important that whatever we build, to what extent can we somehow repurpose, reutilize this under different market conditions. <laughs> then, based on our past mistakes, we wanted to extract both business processes, <coughs> business rules, away from the code. So get it outside of, of whatever Java-based code. Then we wanted to have data flowing here and there in real time. So no more batches, real time information to, to a scale of whatever possible. And of course, whatever we build, since we are building up for the future, should be eventually scalable. And the main goal of this exercise is not to introduce some fancy new tools and, and whatever, but to have a significant impact towards our business, and this is most importantly reduce time to market. Meaning the sort of this business agility we have been talking already here today. That's okay. How fast can I get from the from an idea to to a product and to to a launch? And this is what we've built, or this is what we've envisioned within the smart IT concept. We have some channels, which in our case are either web-based or mobile-based. 
Then we have settled that, okay, we need a unified and nice API layer towards those channels. Here, after a heated discussion, we went on to try out and, and do a graph-based API instead of REST, because we felt that this is much more flexible towards UIs and user experience because we can pretty much pick whatever the data we would like in one query and have the screens really flexible without having to do three, four, five, I don't know how many round trip towards the rest end point to get all the data that we need in these composite UIs. And then underneath, we settled on this, we call it the business integration layer, where we have the business rules, the business processes, and some integration and orchestration on top of some service layer, which we call our really like elementor services. So those are all sort of microservices in this context, but the biggest difference between them is that the blue ones, they are not allowed to hold any logic. It's about the orange ones that are about the logic, about the rules, and about defining the integrations, and we stream everything from this layer into our stream processing layer, where we are building various projections to be used here and there. So that's kind of the concept. And now, how to eat this <coughs> elephant? We need to do this divide and conquer, all according to domain-driven design. So set the boundary, set the bounded context, uh, and set up how this is going to be built in terms of organization. So we split all these microservices into various bounded contexts. And the goal of this exercise was to have a clear ownership. And this also shaped the whole organization because we reshuffled and reorganized all the development teams around this split. That okay, if we now have these microservices, one of the biggest benefits of them is that in theory more people should be able to work on that. So we wanted to make sure that we kind of diminish whatever conflicts and dependencies between the teams. So we split them up according to within the bounded context. We enforce that services need to be idempotent, consistent, and they are a single source of truth for that kind of data in the organization. And as I said, goal is to have autonomous and independent teams which have a certain level of sort of this autonom autonomous behavior, they can choose pretty much most of the aspects. We enforce some company-wide standards, but otherwise we give them free hand to come up with the best solution which they need to tackle within their environment. In terms of technology, what we what we run, what we do. So we are a Java-based shop now. Spring Boot is our main Backend stack, we use a little bit of Scala together with Kafka streams for this uh, data streaming part. We settled for uh, Apache Avro as sort of message serialization format because we wanted to make sure we are able to talk to systems outside of the JVM world. So we went for uh, this cross-platform serialization. We did research between couple of them settled for Avro. For these business processes, which we have a great deal of them because of these like geographic presence, we are using Camunda, where we model and run our business processes or our long-running business processes, and it also does process orchestrations. To a certain extent, it almost behaves like a saga because we built all our processes that they react on the back on the, uh, to message-driven gateways. So kind of really similar approach. We were also thinking back of them about sagas, but find out that it's pretty much impossible to nicely encapsulate this business logic and this flow in, in, in Java code, in plain Java code. And as mentioned, we use the Apple stack on, on the API, on the public API layer, and that is built uh, in OGS in TypeScript. 
So what we built is we call it this Sphera OS or the Sphera Atom Operating System. And in a nutshell, it's uh, up to date. I was trying to pick some interesting numbers. So it's 35 plus microservices as of now. This plus means because we have like many, many country specific data sources we are utilizing. So this number is growing. <coughs> which were implemented, we ran them all within a container platform, we went for OpenShift, so everything is running within, a, within an OpenShift cluster. This is our stream processing components, which we are used to build the projections toward, let's say, what we show on the channels. It's an average of 18 milliseconds currently, we have a latency that we are able to build these, these projections based on the influx of events from, from the various systems, so it's indeed as real time as it gets now. And to get us to this stage, it took us, if we are not counting the preparation phase, 12 months. So from development start to our first production pilot, this was done within a time span of 12 months. We started in August 2017 and, and went into the first pilot production a year later. So what's the role, what's the role of Exxon in, in this whole endeavor? And why we did pick Exxon? So my experience with Exxon started before I even joined the company. I have pretty much discovered by accident back then. And then kind of started to started to play around with it, started to use, and, and the more I was getting familiar with it, the more sense it made that, okay, there is something really to build applications in, in the way this technology promotes. I even pushed a couple of commits back in the day when I had more time to do some actual work. <laughs> and we like it because it promotes a decoupled architecture by its, its, its nature. And also forces you into this domain-driven design thinking, just by the way how it's laid out. It's, you have to kind of switch your, switch your mind. And the code that it produces is, is really clean because of these separations and because of this. You, you know where what belongs and it's easy to, to take a project and immediately sort of get a feel what's, what's going on inside. And it's microservice friendly per nature. So we did not build the whole platform using Exxon. We chose a couple of services where it made sense for us. And this is pretty much our questionnaire in a nutshell, where we were deciding that, OK, do we use Exxon? Do we use event sourcing or, or no? And boils down to roughly to these four questions. If the intent is equally important as the outcome, or is auditing a key concern, is, is the transition data that important as, as the actual state? And whether we need to have the ability to see aggregates in time? If the answer is yes to most of these questions, then it makes sense to embark on this kind of technology. And this is what we, we did, and I will show you a couple of use cases where we went for the Exxon implementation. First one is within our IDET management bounded context. <coughs> we have both our customer database, our primary customer database, and our constant management system. Both are built using Exxon. And Funny thing that those two used to be like one deployment, one service, but we split them out. So yes, indeed, what Alard is talking about, that it's easy to move out. It's true, because we've separated this somewhere halfway along when we found that, OK, this system is getting way too complex and, and starts to handle much more than we feel it should. We just decided, OK, now we take out this aggregate route and move it into a separate deployment, and that's it. And both these services stream data towards our Kafka infrastructure, where we do the transformation <laughs> towards these uh, Avro message types. And on top of it, we have a facade, which is encapsulating business operations on top of this uh, 
bounded context. What are the benefits for us in this case using Exxon? We have an audit of sensitive data. So it's customer data and we know each change, when, why it happened. We can see the state of the aggregate within time. So in cases that let's say an account could be compromised and something would be changed, we can really trace back that, okay, this is the point in time where it happened. Eventually we can even fix it by sort of canceling out those events and returning the aggregate to the correct state. So yeah, the ability to reconstruct in time. Then the synchronization outside of the bounded context. So those two services stream its data as it happens and it gets into our streaming infrastructure where we either build some projections from there or we have some external systems react to those events. For example, the consents, they are being streamed and replicated in, in uh, Salesforce. So, and it's happening real time because it's, it's real listening to this event. And of course, the coupling, those are separate deployments. It's, they have nice boundaries. We know what happens where. And the second use case we have is the application management. Uh, within our organizational application, we treat an application that is something that gathers data and stores data through the process of when a customer requests something from us. So this is like, in our case, we are a pure digital business. We don't have any physical locations where the customers would go in. So we treat all business through the internet. And this uh, app and our application manager, microservice, we have actually more of them handling various types of, of what we call the business application. Collect the data as, let's say, the onboarding process goes forward. And then again, all the data flows into our Kafka infrastructure. And in this case, it triggers various actions when an application gets to a certain state. So if you, let's say, think about uh, the loan account example, as soon as the application is confirmed by the client, so basically there's a process in which we do KYC, we do various checks, we do credit worthiness and so forth and so forth. We provide an offer and by the time the customer accepts the offer, a message is sent asynchronously to the backend instructing it, okay, please open a loan account on behalf of this application, on behalf of these data. Here the use case benefits are, again, insights over transition data. In this case, it's quite important because many times the customer starts with something and he ends up with something totally else. And since we store the transitions and we kind of know the track of the events, we can find interesting intelligence that, okay, what are the maybe the cross-sell ratios? What are the segments that actually request something, but then in the end, end up choosing something different. So there is additional, additional data in this. And the same, ability to reconstruct something within time, synchronization outside of the bounded context, and in this case also asynchronous process integration uh, orchestration that on behalf of this event, a separate bounded context picks it up and does it, its thing. What have we learned? This is the most important message. It's always work in progress. So whatever you do, and it's never, never finished. So you need to think and adjust mentally that, okay, I built something for a time and always, always have this uh, in the back of your mind that we need to find solutions that are not just working now, but they are kind of easy to evolve to, to serve future needs because it's always a work in progress as we have found out. Then, about event sourcing, what are the cons and pros? The pros of an event sourcing system is the event log. What are the cons? Surprisingly, the event log. <laughs> Why? It's kind of like, reminds you all of your past mistakes and in a really painful way. So that's why measure twice, cut once, before, because 
whatever you screw up in the past, it will travel with you. But at the same time, you can still do a replay, which balances things out, because then the query models are quite a piece of cake. And this we have witnessed <coughs> already, where we needed to change the query models because it was not implemented, I wouldn't say correct. It, for a time it was correct, but then we found out that we have some performance issues and so forth and so forth. We were able to rebuild the query models, replay the events, nobody notices anything. So in this case, it's very convenient, but this is this balance that there are positive and negative sides to this kind of approach. Then watch your contracts in a distributed environment. This, is, this, this can kill a whole, whole program because if you don't enforce schema and contract evolution <coughs> rules, then things get out of hand. This is something we witnessed really early in the project and luckily we were able to correct at the early stage what we did. We are really running validations and rules and enforcing whatever is happening to both our REST interfaces and both our sort of overall message types in terms of maintaining big word compatibility and, and keeping some sort of governance on top of. For REST, we, we use Swagger Hub as our primary source of truth for all the API designs. And what we did is we have a validator that on build time checks the contract implemented in the microservice. And if it's not against what's in the spec, in the specification, the build will fail. So this way we are forcing developers to really like implement those contracts. And in this messaging world, what we do is we run the confluence schema registry and we build something we call an everlizer, which is then again a set of tools where we maintain all the schemas and it checks when, when, whenever something is changed. It checks whether it is backward compatible by trying to deploy to some sort of development uh, schema registry. If it, it's not working, so somebody makes a break and change, then it fails. And then out of this, we are building jars for all the, all the components to include, and they have all the integration protocols. So this way, we are keeping schema evolution and, and, and message evolution sort of contracts under control. And Lastly, and most importantly, the microservice platform is all in. And all in means it affects the whole organization. It's not just about the way how, how it's built. So, okay, we change towards a different architectural pattern. Maybe we build those fancy microservices. But if we don't tailor the whole thing around, then it's not going to work. Because if operation so we're not adapting a different mindset. If the organization is not adapting a different mindset, then you have like clash, because you have a technology that is acting contrary with, let's say, the processes and the standards within the company. So this is, this is maybe the most important message of, of this all, that it requires much more than just an IT implementation, an IT work to make this kind of system happen. Because what's the benefit of building a CI CD pipeline where you have a company policy that you release once per two weeks. Nothing. Yeah, so those kinds of like constraints, those need to be aligned. So that's about our journey. Thank you very much. In case you have any questions either now or later, feel free to 